All right. Well, we can get started, I guess. Well, a couple of people probably still rolling in. Uh, but welcome, everybody, to yet another iteration of the Open Game Media Open Office Hours. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, the Open Game Data Community is an NSF-funded research incubator um, looking to bring together collective researchers interested in the use of data generated in and around games to advance our scientific understanding of thinking, learning, decision-making, human psychology broadly construed. Um, and we have two primary goals with this community. So one is to compile a collection of resources, best practices, thinking about how people use data with games to do science. And then long-term, we're looking to build some actual hard infrastructure that encodes a lot of these best practices and makes it easier for new people to do this stuff, makes it easier for us to share our techniques and, 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 and approaches across each other to further advance the science of, of, of working with games. Um, we have a bunch of resources already in the Open Game Data community. So there's the Open Game Data website hosted Field Day Games, <clears throat> which shows some examples of, of code that's available and games that can be tried out. We have an Open Game Data Slack that we use to coordinate um, among the community. Uh, and then we have these Open Game Data Office Hour sessions, um, like the one we're having today, where we are collecting a bunch of worked examples around this kind of work, recording them, and making that available to the community. So how these sessions work, they're inspired by a set of sessions that the statistical education research group used to do at Carnegie Mellon, where somebody, usually a grad student or a postdoc, would present on their work uh, and, and then publicly workshop with one of the members of the stats faculty who would raise things like, have you thought about doing this? Or, or what about this question? Or show me your code and let me see if you're actually writing in the right regression model or something. Um, and as an audience member in those sessions, it was super useful to see sort of how do experts think through this problem um, how do they uh, approach these these topics? Um, and so we're doing the same thing here, but focusing on game data, statistics generally. Some things to keep in mind is the presenters are generally gonna be showing work that is in progress. So some things might be very sketchy, they might be um, just new, fresh ideas. And so we wanna be conscious that sometimes that takes courage to do um, and consider it that these things aren't necessarily gonna be polished. Um, our goal here is to help the presenter understand their problem, make progress on their project, and help them achieve their goals. But also these sessions are about learning for everybody involved. So if somebody raises an idea or a question or something and you don't know what that means, feel free to raise a hand and ask for clarification. Um, or if you have a suggestion for the presenter, um, feel free to raise your hand and do that as well. And with that, I'll hand it off to Dave, who will be uh, our presenter for this week. Awesome, thank you. So this is going to be some very work in progress stuff today, but I'm, I think that's what I like about these meetings is it's actually like not, I'm not coming here to show off. <laughs> it's like coming here to like really get some help. Uh, let me make sure I can do this. The slides in the portion of the screen. I made a shift just like right before we started. Okay. Are you seeing... Uh, a slide down? You're seeing slides, yeah. Okay, perfect, cool. So yeah, here's the project. Um, I'm We're working, our whole team right now is really getting on board with Replay. And I saw that, uh, I think we've got a perfect audience for this one today because between Eric's uh, dissertation, which uh, believe it or not, I've been reading. <laughs> uh, and then Elizabeth Rowe, I saw you're here too. This is awesome. Um, I'm hoping that we can have some some good conversations around like the use of replay. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of set up the context of where we're using it, but I know that we've got some expertise in the room, which is going to be great. Um, so here's the, here's the project. Um, we have a NSF funded ASL, so an informal learning project around uh, polar research. So this is research that are happening at the North and South Pole. And I've already presented on um, one of the projects that came out of that, Waddle, and showed how we did that study around uh, empathy and embodiment. And uh, we'll be talking about that one a little bit today because it's the one that's kind of done, it's in the wild, we're collecting data on it. So it's kind of the test bed for the kind of work we wanna do with the other ones. So. Uh, in total, we'll have five of these experiences, Waddle being one of them. And uh, we just finished up a beta for uh, the next one that I'll, sh I'll show a screenshot or two of here in a minute. And what we're really noticing is that 
we are not great at doing usability research with VR. I think it's just harder is what it comes down to. Um, so put this into context, you know, we're building things iteratively that we want to have used by a public audience. And anybody that's ever built games or interactive systems of any sort know that you just have to watch people interact with it in order to figure out, you know, how to iterate and how to change it. Um, so we're, we really feel uh, blind going into these projects because we're just not getting the usability data we normally do uh, when we do a desktop game. So a little bit more context. The first one, Waddle, um, and the one that we'll be spending the most time on today is a, a project where you embody, uh, directly embody an Indeli penguin. So you're, uh, you have a beak that sits out in front of, kind of right out in front of your nose. And that's the one way you interact with the world. And then you have flippers uh, that replace your arms when you look down. And that's another way you interact with the world. And to move around in this world, you, you waddle back and forth. And that that gesture of having your whole upper body move is what kind of advances you in whatever direction you're going. And we'll see a, a video about this one in a minute. But the newest one, I'll show you just a clip from. Um, this one is modeled after. Uh, here, and I'll, Plenty, not easy, on. easy. I could fly through that. I wonder if I can turn off the audio of this while I'm doing it. Uh, it's open. Oh, here we go. Better, if you don't mind. Our okay, so in this better. one, you are a. Um, you're someone who's working on these weather stations that are positioned all throughout the South Pole or South Pole area in Antarctica. Uh, these, these stations are um, solar powered with a battery. Then they have an uplink that with um, directly to satellite for data. And it's how we build our worldwide weather models is by having you know dozens and dozens of these uh, spread out through Antarctica. So we were lucky enough to get to work with some of the people that fly down there to uh, use the McMurdo station as a launch pad and then go take helicopters out and and cool like tank kind of vehicles and stuff. And they go and they, they dig these things up and they repair them. And um, so we built a kind of a job simulator style game about doing that where you, um, yeah, go diagnose it. And then you, what we're going to see right now, you take these uh, components back into your uh, into your airplane. Oh, I guess that's at the beginning of it. Oh, here we go. And you work on them and then go set them up again. So those are the two games that we're in the context of, of doing right now. Um, and again, both of those are finished. So we're like just pivoting onto a third one and um, really trying to make sure that these are performing well. So here's the problem. This is what usability testing looks like for us with these VR games. We end up at these like festivals and libraries and there's just a pile of people and it's like it's so hard to pay close attention um because uh you know you can't see what someone sees in vr you have to cast it to an external screen and that reliably doesn't work very well <laughs> like it's it's like every every time we have problems with it like ev every single time so what ends up happening is even if you've got a very controlled environment and you're you know trying to schedule people um it's so costly, it's so time consuming, it's so noisy. Um, the, the whole process of doing usability with, with this is just harder than opening up a Chromebook and hitting go. Okay, so in our first pass through this, we were just using game telemetry and we started creating some visuals like this one. This is a like a top-down kind of heat mappy uh, version of how people navigate the space and waddle. And then we started playing around with some signal processing and thinking about you know, what, what we could get from just the raw signals of, you know, hands and, and head mounted display gaze. And this one, we played around with uh, the idea of a dot product. So like how rapidly are they moving? Like how chaotic are their movements? And then we started playing around with these kind of 3D uh, gaze visualizations. So this is all kind of one line of work is like, how do you visualize these, you know, complicated 3D interactions in, in easy ways? But what I want to focus on today now is, is really getting into replay. So we already had open game data. So we already had you know, a Unity client and a back end and ways to process and everything. And with really minor modification that we've already deployed out to the uh, Unity client, we were able to uh, support just adding really large chunks of data in the event data stream. So we created three new events. Uh, for this game in particular, viewport data, left-hand data, right-hand data. And if you look at what they contain, it's it's really simple. It's just a JSON formatted array 
of positions and rotations. So we wanted to kind of proof of concept to this thing um, and see if that how that would work and what kind of issues we'd run into. So I, I think right now we're running at 20 frames a second. So we send 20 samples in a package and we send that package every second. Um, but there, there's been no issues with data size or or anything, even in this very verbose JSON formatted way. Like it, it's just, it doesn't look like it's gonna be a concern for, for you know, even modest network connections. The other thing we, we ran into right away was that the way that we're, we're approaching replay is by recording the input signals, as you can see, like, you know, how the user is, is moving. And then really the goal here was let's just stick that back into the game engine and pretend there's a user there. And then the game should just play out the same way it did. And that mostly worked except for at the very uh, end of, of Waddle, like the last activity in there, there's a, a time where you've got to defend your nest against the Skua birds, which are a predator. And we used random numbers generators to like move them around and figure out where they're going to go. So again, really simple solution is we just added a, another data member to the session start event where we passed the random seed that Unity was using. And lo and behold, it works great. You you just you replay the same randomness. So for single player deterministic uh, simulations, this seems like it it's going to work great. Um, so we created a Unity package for this Open Game Data uh, Replay, and it's um, uh, it's a module that I think you can also get this off the Unity Package Manager the same way you can the the Open Game Data Telemetry client. And it's really easy to set up. You you basically just um, for the for playback at least you you just pick your uh, your objects in the hierarchy that are going to be controlled by the, by this replay stuff. So the gaze kind of uh, camera rig, uh, the right hand and the left hand objects, and then it it just hooks it right up and plays it. Pick the script and hit go. Um, you also can specify a whole folder for uh, you know batching up a bunch of these replays together. The way we approach it right now is that. It plays back the signals into the into the game engine and then generates a video file as the output, which is just much, much easier to move around, but obviously has a lot of a lot of issues. It doesn't really matter what the video file is. Like if you wanted to play back a different camera angle or you know some other scene or multiple cameras, you could do that, um, but we haven't yet. So practically, uh, I'll give you like a, a little demo of, of what this looks like. So here's a video recording right off the Quest headset to get an idea of what the interaction looks like when you're just recording the frames right from headset. And that looks like this. And then for uh, reference, then here is a replay uh, using only telemetry at 20 frames a second, back through the game engine, and then the video clip that came out of that. So it works great. It it it's it's surprisingly um, effective. You might have noticed that the frame rate there was almost too smooth, and and that's because we we do do a, a like an interpolation interpolation uh, effect to smooth out those twenty frames a second. Okay, so that's the that's the context. It started with a little bit of like, can we build it? How hard is it going to be? What is our lowest kind of like proof of concept demo and. Um, and that's where we're at. And all those packages are all up on GitHub and you know easily used. So we're moving toward now using this across all the games in the in this package. So really we I think there's like kind of two questions that we had right now, which were first off, like can can we use replay to help with usability? Um, like does it does it help if we get this running? Because <laughs> unfortunately or not, I end up being a gearhead sometimes and just like building things because building things is fun. So the, the first part is like, does it help anybody? And then the second question is, once, we, once we've got it running, can we use automated methods like others have done um, to do detection of, of you know, interesting you know, phenomenon that we see while watching replay? So can we automate that process? And can we do it around usability? So, as soon as we ran a batch of these, it, it, we didn't even do a formal process. It was like, as soon as we ran the batch and looked at video files, um, Kevin, who was was the one kind of getting this to work, 
uh, immediately saw three usability issues, like it, without any formal process. We found that players would try to pick up a rock with their hands or flippers, which uh, isn't allowed by nature or the video game. Um, and then the other one we saw is that players in this first scene of the game would pick up a rock uh, that you use to build a nest and they would walk away from the the, net, the target nest where they were supposed to be building and just go like wander off somewhere with, with the rock, not figuring out what to do. And then the last one we saw is they'd pick up a rock and then they would keep on pecking at other rocks to try to pick them up, not understanding that you can only have one in your beak at once. So based on this, you know, we went through the next question of how would we create a detector for this? And as much as we probably could have got it to work given the telemetry that was already in the game, um, we decided to make our processing a lot simpler and just add a couple new events um, that captured some of these states and deploy a new version. So we we did that. It was a really minor change. We added a couple events and then um, put it out on onto uh, the Meta Store again onto App Lab and waited for some more data to start rolling in because we've got kind of a yeah an audience that's already out there playing it. So first first pass on this was that if you do a histogram of the of these three features that we end up having. They're these detectors of these behaviors. Um, we see that the, it, it's kind of an interesting pattern for all of these. You you have the vast majority of people don't have these problems. That's the kind of big graph at the zero. That's the number of times they ran into these issue, issues. And then sometimes you get a little bit of like a curve of a, people that have the issue a few times and then figure it out. But often what you saw is, is counts of like, um, 57 times they tried picking up the the uh, rock the wrong way, you know? So it's like the, just re repeating it over and over and over and over and never figuring it out. So those pop up later in the histograms. So the interesting thing about this is I think it answers our second question, um, or it's really promising towards that second question, which is like, can we create automations now once we've identified these patterns? And it seems like absolutely we can, and we can calculate how often each of these issues is happening and how many users it's affecting. And that's really fantastic for helping us prioritize how we want to approach these usability issues. So all the data sets that I'm talking about and the features I'm talking about are um, including this replay stuff is all live on the open game data site. The, the new features we just added, like just, just added, um, aren't there, but they'll probably be in next month's data dump. So you'll be able to play with these too. Okay. So I've been yapping for, 20 minutes already, and I want to get to the office hours part of this, where I just need your help. So we've got a couple next steps, and I'm hoping to dig into one or two of them kind of in detail. So our first next step where we've got to go is getting hands um, in the system, and we, we just don't have it. We Waddle just didn't use gripping motions. You just had the flippers. So we didn't have to do it then. We're going to have to do it now. I'm not really sure how to do it. Um, because there are just a lot of analog buttons and I'm not exactly sure how to think about it just yet. So if we have time, we'll come back to that. But then the, the big one is rendering out to video is obviously non-optimal. Um, we have to do this in real time. So one 20 minute you know, session takes 20 minutes for Unity to boot up and render. So we've just basically got a bunch of shell scripts running on a, on a VR development machine and we've run like, I don't know, hundreds or at least 500 of these so far um, where we just render out the videos and stick them here. But it's so slow. So that's the topic I want to come back around to here. Um, I really want to start thinking about an annotation system. And I would love it if we can find some examples of things to pull from. Um, I know that Edge at Turk has one. And I know, you know, there's things like in Vivo and such that are, have been around a while. But I'm looking for design references for those. Um, obviously, multiplayer is an issue um, as well at some point, but it won't come up in our games. So kind of first question for the group is like, what are some of the other big directions we should even be looking with with this idea of replay? Like, what, what are some of the things that you've heard of um, or papers that you've you know seen that you think should be on our radar as we're kind of planning next steps? So... So when you mentioned all the data is available, is the replayer available too? Yeah. And and that's a Unity project? Is that a compiled out thing? Is that... It's a Unity module you add to your game. Okay. So in this case, the Penguins game 
we um, we added those those three events I mentioned, and that's just those are just regular events. Um, and you can see a sample of that if you go look at the Waddle project on GitHub. But then mm -hmm. to play it back, we just added the the Open Game Data Replay module. It's a it's a Unity package that you can add in, and then hook up. So I'm free in thirty minutes, Mike. Oh, okay. All right, I'll pass the bleeper later. <laughs> it's super yeah. easy to wire up, is the answer. And then yeah, there's like a button right in the Unity menu for rendering out replays and picking which data file you want to use and all that. And so is the idea here? You hit go, and it renders out a video. Yep. Okay. That's how it's set up right now. Because I was thinking, like free annotation system, that's a that, do it in Unity as part yep. of the Unity tool, um, which is a thing I wanted to eventually do with my replayer, but never got around to. Um, because the authoring, the how do you express a query on a replay? It's a complicated thing in three D, um, but I think given that you're doing data replays. I think there's a lot of affordances you can play with here. Like if you're like, I want to know when they get to region X, you can literally just put the collider in Unity and yep. fire when the trigger fires. And yep. um or or if you want to see like are they paying attention to these particular objects, you just like switch their yep. materials to like bright magenta and do they show up in the video or not. Um and so like you can you can play with the fact that all the stuff is there because you're in engine. Um, That's right. Yeah. So like we have already done the ray, the ray tracing kind of like gaze object and can spit out, you know, like an event now based on that. So that's one of the other cool things of replay is like, even if you didn't build the feature in when you set up replay, you can replay it, you know, in engine and then create new features like f that are complicated like that. So yeah, that's already been a, a really exciting possibility. So Hi. Hey. Good to see um, you. Well, I'm I'm not in position to be seen, but you'll have to deal with my image. But um, I will say that we've done all of ours in in Unity, and it's all and we've done I think steps two and three. We're not, and we've done a kind of multi version, but we've done a game that switches perspectives. So the the players switch. I see you switching between players in the same way in the same replay, so that you're. Um, I will say that it's it's super useful instead of just a video. Is it's what I think what Eric was alluding to was that everything is tied to those events that we have. So it's scrubbable by it, you know, it's by round, but it's scrubbable. You can link to very specific events and highlight them and tag just those events. And you can just select which one. So what we haven't done is select which ones you want to see. Like I've already done that by default. It's always our events. Mm. But you could probably say. And then we've overlaid eye tracking on top of it. So we have an eye tracking signal that floats along with whatever they're looking at on the screen. Now it's a little bit more difficult with VR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's, it might be a lot easier actually. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. VR headsets just have eye tracking built into them. Yeah. 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 This is very cool. Very cool. For, for I'm curious actually, Liz, uh, what, frame rate are you collecting your replays at? Because I would think 20, 20 hertz is probably not sufficient for an eye tracker. No. Or right. Are you doing like really gross eye tracking? Right. So so for that game, um, which is Impulse, which is um, that we were much faster. Um, oh. And we had it specially rig it up. <laughs> to, we use lab streaming layer to do the connection. Um, and that's actually part of what we're going to be building with Safe Insights is a way to do that. Um, with with, eye, with very specific eye trackers and linking up to, but that game had very um, rapid data collection anyways because the movement of the objects was very fast. Mm -hmm. Zumbini's I think is much less. And so ours, our collection rate is lower. Um, and, but we don't sync eye tracking yet. We're going to get there. <laughs> That's part of Safe Insights too. Mm. Um, yeah, but this is, it's it's but we had we basically used we had our game developer use the artwork and and basically the data structure and recreate the game in reverse what what David was saying at the beginning so it mm -hmm. looks exactly like 
the scrubbable version looks exactly like what the player saw. Is yeah, it? so let's get into the details of that a little bit because I, I we've had a couple like office conversations about how to pull off the scrubbing. And the the metaphor so far that has taken us the farthest has been that you think of it like keyframes in a video where you basically do snapshots of the game state and then deltas on it. And that something about that just sounds terrible to me. And I'm curious if there's no, other no. ways to do it. No, it, so I think it's it's more like what you described at the beginning. You have all this telemetry data that is about how the player is moving. We also collect a lot of information about the game state itself. So what you know, which Zumbinis are in and what characteristics do they have? Because that matters for what solutions the kids would pick. And so so we collect not only and also what the solution is. So we know in advance in the in the telemetry data what what will work and what won't work. So then we, re we basically recreate the game or using that code and you can watch as the player it as it unfolds exactly as the player played it. Does oh, I sense? see. Mm -hmm. You have a whole different Unity project for replay than from the original. Right. Yeah. Mm. Right. But it's it's definitely um it's super it's fine grained. You can yeah. go as um our our annotation system is tied to those events. So like it's for Zumbinis, it's pick up. <laughs> the player has to actually do something. Um, so they're so like they pick up a Zumbini and they drop it, or it crosses a bridge, and then you know, so there's it's you can only label time between player actions as something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like um and, and we ended up labeling a lot of things by round. Like, you know, we saw, like what you were describing before about the, the picking up the rock, that's really good process information. And we would say that's kind of like a trial and error <laughs> type of thing. And you label the whole round as kind of like, this is evidence that, that they really didn't understand what they were trying to do um, with with that, with the rock, right? They, they were struggling with it. Um, so it's, that's so instead of a histogram, we would do it as more of a this is a this is a an annotation for the entire round of play. Mm. So something that we're seeing, but we do that human coding. Yep. I know Eric probably would prefer to do it automated, and you would prefer to do it automated, but we build oh. automated ways from the humans. Yeah, that mm -hmm. that's kind of where we're heading with this is you know, humans to find the patterns and then machines to find them at scale. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The right. way that my replayer worked is similar to Liz where um, mine was still in the same Unity project. It was convenient, it was a puzzle game and every scene, every level was basically the same proto scene so I could run stuff through it. But so I had a dedicated scene for my replayer. Yeah. Um, and uh, all of my things, all of my events were full state and then the event action. And so for example, like you, you were saving seed and then replaying the seed. Yeah. I would just record where all of the monsters are all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and then I don't need to see. And that's mainly because uh, this was a physics-based interaction, and physics is determined is documented non-deterministic. So uh, interpolation is not going to work if you're relying on the physics. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll start to fall out of fall out of accuracy eventually. And so we needed to do essentially the key essentially the keyframe thing is what I did, um, where it's you have the keyframe state and then a forward event. Um, you could think about if you if if you're worried about volume of data for that, which totally get that. Um, you could think about having like a slower heartbeat keyframe, where it's like every second or every three seconds or something, just so that like, because essentially what you're doing for a scrubber is it's, it's an indexing problem, and as long as you have something to latch onto to be the key, and then you interpolate from there, it's not as much of a nightmare. But yeah, yeah. It, it is a bit of a nightmare. Um, I'm really thinking towards reusability because we know we're doing it for the next three games. So it's like, it, it's always nice when you know you have to stamp a thing out and we kind of know the shape of the next couple games um, roughly. But I'm really hoping that we can come up with something that's uh, like per in a perfect world. You would just like put a label or like a tag on objects in the hierarchy and say, these mm -hmm. are replayable. Yep. Um, and so, then it would be included in the state and 
Yeah. So, so to give you another example, a project I've gone on to do from my replayer is this um, this Twitch overlay extension system where we send data out to Twitch and it can render it on top of a video. We literally use keys and tweens as a first class concept in that system. <laughs> so, so you attach a you attach a model behavior and either it records at a key frame rate or a tween frame rate. Um, and and then you override that to say what is in your keyframe data. And that's like exactly how it actually records itself. Um, oh. And so you have the keys in the tweens. Uh, we're starting to hit the point. It's like, do we really need both in our particular case? Yeah. But um, but yeah, it's essentially you would just attach an object to it and say record everything that you would need to grab out of whatever model behaviors are also attached to this thing goes in the state um, and record that. So you just have to override one function per major prefab in your world. and. Um, and then it just registers itself to a recorder and everything automatically and all that stuff. So uh, um, that's how I would build my replayer now if I were to rebuild it. Um, is you essentially have this trackable that you can just turn on. Yeah, it's just a trackable parameter. Yeah. Uh, I, then it's interesting now that we've got, um, you know, like Liz's work and and that really was doing things in a separate separate from the original game engine. And I'm kind of curious pros and cons of that. Like it, in practice, um, how's that worked out? Because that, that's a possibility too, is that we build like some sort of replayer as a separate tool. And I don't know how that would work exactly, but it would be like, you're almost using the, yeah, I don't know how to auto, or not, it's not automate. I don't know how to replicate that or like re, get a lot of reusability out of that. Because it seems like it, for every game, then you have to build the game and the replayer for the game. But that's what we do. Does it ha has that <laughs> had advantages? Um. Well, you get completeness. <laughs> you get everything, right? There's no, it, the timing is exact. Everything's exact. There's no interpolation of anything. Um. So it's it's. It allows us to be more, um, so we're not trying to do real time yet. I would say that, that's a real, you can't do real time with that model <laughs> um, because it take it does take, it, you can't do it, you'd always be around behind the way that the data <laughs> collection works, oh, yeah. right? So, this, oh, so it, the game is playing, the, the player's playing, the, it sends data back up to the server at the end of the round, then oh. we can access it through the replayer right away um but it's always going to be delayed um it just allows our replayer our tagging allows multiple people to do it we have reliability analyses in it um so we have other things that are that make it worthwhile for us mm. um, because of the types of analysis we do um but i can see where if you want replay if you want real time it's going to be really hard <laughs> I haven't even been that. thinking about real time, but now that you've said it, now I want that too. Well, but I think <laughs> if you set it up, so I think there's a distinction between if you're building the replayer in the game itself versus two separate Unity projects or whatever. I think that's a, that's that's more a how do you run your engineering team question than than how do you run your analysis. But if you do the keyframe thing, you should be able to run it in real time because you can you you know the context of any event. Yeah, it's automatically, just... it's it's a it's you can index into anywhere within the video within the replay, mm -hmm. and and no context. Now, if you want to know cross multi event context, then yeah, you need to know how to define that window. But um, but that's one of the benefits of not relying on interpolation is you can index into anywhere. So if you only care about certain like you know if you only care about like the rock pickup events, you don't have to run the whole video. You just grab the rock pickup events, throw them back into Unity. You know everything that's going on now calculate whatever you want, pick out an event. Um, or run it for five seconds or whatever from, from yeah. the events. So I, I will say that for at least for us with the lab the types of things that we're labeling. Um, so like computational thinking behaviors. <laughs> um, it for me the what happens before and after those rock events would matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you so 
for us, I don't think we, we don't want to separate those things out. We want to see them in the context of the whole round of play. So that the fact that the, that it's the 50th time that that kid did that mm-hmm. is an important piece of information. Now, mm-hmm. yes, you could automate that, but I think that um, when it's not, I don't know how to express it, when it's more complex concepts, like we had a lot of features underneath our game, our, our running underneath the game that we then used to build detectors of the, of the things that we were labeling, because the things that we were labeling were more complex. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, as an example, um, like the pizza pass puzzle, which I think Eric, you might be, I hope you guys, they're basically trying to figure out which pizza the troll likes and there's a set of toppings. So one of the things that we were really interested in is whether or not they repeated the same pizza because that's kind of a mistake <laughs> because they don't, they've already gotten the information for that particular one. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but the pizza itself, what that picking that particular pizza means depends on what pizzas they've done before. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm totally so- with you on that too, that all the telemetry is, is already there. And we started thinking about telemetry with replay in mind as well. So it, it's kind of like a thing that Luke and I will say is if we have nailed the telemetry, we should be able to do replay just from it. That means we are really capturing all the reactions and system responses and all that. Um, so that that whole feature engineering and telemetry layer is happening, I think, irregardless. The thing that's been new about this is that normally in that telemetry, we haven't had a deal with, well, what renders out to 90 frame per second head movements you know so Mm -hmm. it's like that was the new thing here that was like these crazy amounts of data around movement and positionality and rotations and stuff yeah we we had similar with the eye tracking adding that kind of data on top of the game data (laughs) is the synchronization is is rough Um, that that leads me to another question um that i really had for for the group here which is um are you aware of any projects that have added in um, audio recording or audio transcription as like into a, into a telemetry or replay project? Because it, I feel like there's we constantly bump against this idea that if we had richer kind of talk events around uh, our gameplay, specifically this VR stuff, that it would really help. And there's like a whole host of technical and ethical concerns there. So I'm curious if anybody else has already gone ahead and failed in some of the ways that that one might fail. Do you mean like uh, speak aloud while they play, like why they play this move, why they play that move, something like that? Exactly. Or if people are playing together to hear them talking with each other. So I I think I've mentioned that we did this with ScreenFlow. We use ScreenFlow to record them playing the game that's also capturing their telemetry data. And we ask them to think aloud. Mm-hmm. But they're not, but it's, we, if they're not synced. <laughs> the audio transcription is not mm-hmm. synced. We, we do the syncing manually. Um, so mm. that, that's, a, that's a very basic way, but it's not what you're looking for, I think. Yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest issue there would be kind of the clapboard problem of how do you get the initial some event that you activate in game that also makes sound that shows up on the audio transcript <laughs> uh, to know where they all, they all, oh, well, so we, they give them a common zero. Um, because we're in VR, we have to, the assumption I've had is that it's all coming from the game. So we've got mm-hmm. code running in the game that's doing the audio recording and transcription. Right. Um, so we would we shouldn't have a time issue. The, the synchronization should be there because it's all running in one timeline. Um, I don't know if anybody that's done, well, I could maybe ask around because there's people around here that have done those kinds of like sensors in classroom type of stuff. Yeah. Which has its own home host of insane ethical problems because um, everybody in the classroom has to consent. But uh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. But like I've seen things like that more done like in a, in like a lab scale, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and uh, but I think it's usually they have audio and then you would record it to the video. But like you could be doing snippets of audio, sending it out to a speech to text thing, 
and inserting the text into the log trace. Yeah, and there's a, a model a that speech uh, event. Um, I, I think OpenAI just released a um, audio to text model that will run in Unity on a Quest. And I think those models have only recently gotten to the point where you could do that. That's right. Feasibly. Yeah, that's um, that's my understanding is that that's really real time. It, it's really leveraging that, or the idea is that you've got this thing strapped to your head and it's got like 10 cameras looking out at the world and a microphone. Um, and can we do anything interesting with that? I know we're, we're outside what we could distribute openly, but even... Record, yeah, recording the way kids are interacting with each other, um, or like someone mentioned, like Jimmy mentioned, just prompting them to think aloud, just like we do when we're on Zoom calls with our desktop games. It seems like that'd yeah. be a really rich data set. Ha having them play in pairs is a natural way to have that yep. come out. <laughs> Even if but it's not a multiplayer game, like I feel like I've seen the one kid is observing and one kid is playing, and then you keep them talking. Mm -hmm. cool. Or uh, if you're running this in like museums and libraries and stuff, like a kid and a parent. Yeah. That probably similar dynamic. So uh, when you when you're thinking about the open AI um, transcription, you still have the actual recording, right? It's a choice. It I, I would imagine that from an IRB standpoint, it would be easier to get talk events that don't have the audio. But I, I think from a research standpoint, both, if we're already consenting and stuff, then I'd want the other. All the well, intonation. It's, it's, it's a question of how reliable is the AI for kids yeah, and their speech patterns and the language, like, yeah, and different groups of kids. Because um, I, I mean, I've tried using that for a couple of things and I don't find it for, you know, I have to go back and, and refine it afterwards. I can't just totally just rely on it. Um, but so yeah, if you're already consenting, you may as well. You may as well get it, yeah. And then just recording it on the headset solves and sending audio data along with event mm -hmm. data simplifies that there's no systems that need to be synchronized with each other. Just put the headset on and you're you're capturing all that at once, mm -hmm. um, which sounds really elegant. The the transcription thing, I I think I've got a a, a not so se secret hope that there's some version of an IRB exemption that we could still get through if we never record the audio, never send the audio and mm -hmm. we scrub it for anything identifiable before it hits the network. My, I've got some, some little hope that I can get an IRB exemption that still has all that rich talk event data coming in. Anonymous. Yeah, I think it'd be a bit of a stretch. Uh, um, if you have audio, so you're saying you'd throw the audio away essentially, and you would yeah only for for text. like a public version of it where we would be we'd still be IRB exempt because we only would be looking at the um the transcribed words with some protection that no identifiable information could even go across that line that we would and sterilize the data. Some, I it'd be it'd be hard because like if somebody says their friend's name. PIs in the data now. Yep, you got to pull out any name. You got to pull out anything that sounds like a phone number, an address. Yeah. Um, valiant effort. I mean, so the, like the, the class recording project here, they do that. They 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 destroy the raw data, oh. um, and they only look at process features and stuff. Partly for volume reasons. Uh. That's a lot of data. <laughs> Yeah. If you just essentially have a recording system running in the classroom eight hours a day for a semester, uh, it's it's too much to hold on to everything on top of all the identifiability problems. Um, and they needed to get special dispensation from the IRB mm. to not have to not have to retain data for three years because that's the usual requirement. Um, but yeah, um, you could try. I think it'd be hard. Mm. Uh, but at that point, you might as well just like if people are considering it anyway and all that. So mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't be able to release it as easily. Um, so that's an interesting question. If you want to do those kinds of utterance things, they probably can't be open. Yeah. Um, and we've already, we already that do open that, open you know, where like some of the data is open, some of it is protected behind, you know, IRB. 
for one particular population. So that's already kind of, mm -hmm. that already happens, but. Liz, I'd be really curious if you have any screenshots of your replayer tool that are available somewhere, because I haven't ever seen it in any of the papers that I've read from you. So we have a chapter in a book um, on innovative ways of using ed tech or technology in, in education research, something like that. Mm. And that one has pictures, screenshots of the of the data, um, of the data arcade repo tool. And I think we have, we might have a screenshot of the eye tracking. Um, I can easily share those with you too. I can also give you a demo. I'm happy to give you a demo. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe that's how myself. we should approach so, it is just to maybe I'll set up a time with you just to demo it and see what we can glean and learn from what you've already done here. Um, yeah, Three in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, actually, yeah, we I'm not in two weeks. I'm, I'm traveling <laughs> in two weeks. But... Okay. Uh... Well, the the bigger. Um, thing that makes that funny is I think what Eric's getting at is we need um we need some more people we need somebody for next we, need, session, we yeah. need people to present um, these. so we could make it one of the if you're willing we could make it one of these sessions where you just do a demo and show us your replayer tool and let me let me look at my calendar and yeah yeah, yeah just just not two weeks from now okay cool <laughs> yeah that that wouldn't be a, that'd be a nice way to do that if you're willing to do it openly yep I'll tell you where we're going mm -hmm. next right now um, is that we are running this this little detector on like 500 sessions that have come in since we rolled out the, the update that gets the new telemetry. And I'm just going to create those histograms for these main features. And then that's going um, in a paper for a joint conference in serious games. We'll be submitting that just as like early, early proof of concept. But then the next move with it or the direction we were thinking about going was to just double down on all the video process approach and automate the creation of videos so that every session that night, we also create the video for it and effectively use a, know that they'll be slightly out of sync with the telemetry, but they'll be kind of close too, <laughs> and creating a video-based annotator. Um, that so basically you'd scrub the video and you could add an annotation and we would mark the time code of that and we'd know that it's a little sloppy within how it lines up with the telemetry but that it's within a second or so you know like it, it's not going to be terrible and we can use that for doing more of the kind of you know educational data mining approaches with detectors and looking for interesting interaction patterns and that that approach so we were thinking let's go down that route because it's just really simple and we get a lot of value right away. So I'm kind of debating Why? whether or not it makes sense for us to to go in engine and build that whole thing now or just build a, a, yeah. a Band-Aid version in PHP, basically. Yeah. Like, why do it over video when you've got the engine there? <laughs> well, that from and an graphic system. interactive system and the capacity to raycast and full knowledge of geometry and everything. <laughs> yep. That's the it seems like that would scientist. be easier to do than write it in PHP, right? <laughs> I don't know yet. That was my whole original philosophy behind this. It's like, I could try to write some weird Python thing to come up with this feature, or I could just use all the APIs that Unity already gives me, and yeah. it would take me like two minutes instead of days. <laughs> um, and so like, yeah, you got, you got all the stuff there. You might as well just do Unity. I'll take that as encouragement to to do it the right way. Because <laughs> like it's obvious that that's the right way to do it in this next yeah. step. But some sort of annotator is definitely the next step now. I think it'd be interesting to explore. Maybe there's a project in this down the line or something of um, what kinds of things could be annotated. So not just like this event is happening, but like could you? I think I've wanted to explore with the replay player, and I have. A, picked my replay back up in a while because it's several versions of the deal at this point but um 
annotating a property of a state. So like a dumb example that I've used in a multiplayer game I've worked on is like, there's a bunch of cars driving around. It's like, how close are they to each other? And I just want to know that all the time. Say I didn't put that in my telemetry. The replayer can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you could do, I don't know, like how often are they moving towards the egg or whatever? I don't, I don't, I can't immediately think of, of a great dumb example in this, but, um, but how would you express that within Unity without having to dump it to code in a way that could run over the replay and give you that metric? Um, because you could do that. You have everything there. <laughs> So uh, I think that would be really interesting to explore how you do those kinds of annotation. Um, so not just like a thing happened, which is like a very basic annotation, but like mm -hmm. actually drawing on the state that like, I want this and this, and I want to know how they relate to each other. And I want to know it at 90 frames a second go. Yeah. Um, mm. I, I was, uh, I, I was going to say that eye tracking for us we, we ended up overlaying the eye tracking data on the game telemetry and we ended up asking questions like, you know, when is the eye gaze within X number of millimeters of the player particle, which is the, the main one that the player manipulates. And so we created features that were combined features between mm. the two streams of data. Um, we didn't use, we didn't get to detectors. <laughs> we were just trying to do that proximity measure to see if that was a useful outcome mm. measure. To, um, so I will say the precision, the synchronization precision, precision is, uh, I did it by hand for impulse when we first did that. That was, it was a nightmare before we had the eye tracking data <laughs> um, just to get our labels onto it. Now we're, I think our tool is more qualitative, but you can build feature, quantitative features from the data that you're already collecting and mm. track those alongside of it. Mm. So you could create the, how many times has this happened in a, you know, how many times has this happened in a row? Kind of some feature that you're just seeing distance between this and this, and you tell it how to calculate it and it just does it. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. That's a goal. Yeah. <laughs> We're not there or, yet. But we have something, some, you know, we have something that's kind of in progress. Mm -hmm. um, but, or, or, or think about for maybe a better dumb example for the penguin case is like, oh, they seem stuck here in this, in this part of the map. How many times do they come back here? So defining here as a moment in a replay, but then that can spawn out a collider and then they can go away and you can check how many times they come back to that. Mm -hmm. Like you can do that kind of stuff because you know about the world. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be super cool. I, I would mm -hmm. love to work on something like that. <laughs> um, and I know this is about helping you and not, hey, I have this cool idea. What we can do. Well, we're, we're going to be at this for a couple of years. Still, <laughs> so we're like funded to basically ask this question of what can we do with VR signals in terms of data mining and understanding affect and knowledge generally. So we've got a very open-ended um, research project here. So I think we somewhere along the line, we're like, well, let's get basic telemetry and replay up and running and then see where to go from there, you know, like that. And so I, I think some of these tools, even just coming up with new methods is in scope for this project. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is, a, as always, I love it when I'm able to come to these office hours and share a very, very much work in progress. Like I'm writing this thing up right now for a paper we're going to try to finish on Friday. <laughs> it's like, I'm looking at data sets that aren't even like, totally reliable yet you know we're like we're definitely doing it live right now um so it's cool to be able to share on it get some ideas of where we should be heading what experiences people have had well if you don't manage to make that deadline by friday there's always meaningful play i see that we've got some stuff going to meaningful play too i think we've got at least two things queued up for that deadline january 5th for yeah. anyone interested um all right well thank you all for joining us again for another open office hour session. Um, as we alluded to, we uh, currently don't have someone signed up for the next session in two weeks. So if any of you have a burning thing you wanna share with the community, let us know. Um, and then uh, otherwise we do have two weeks after that in the first, first week of June or the first session in June, um, we do have somebody lined up for that. So uh, um, we will let you know what's what's um 
on the docket for next time. Cool. See you all around. Thank you very much. Thank you.